Just want to uh, check the mic. My counsel, these mics are working now. <laughs> Okay, we'll call the uh, session to order. We're going to start with a, a moment of reflection. Let us be mindful of the needs of all of our citizens and advance only those causes that will ensure peace and harmony in our community now and always. And acknowledgement. We'd like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we gather today is the land traditionally used by the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and neutral peoples. We acknowledge the enduring presence and deep traditional knowledge and philosophies of the Indigenous people with whom we share this land today. I'll ask Councillor, are there any declarations of a pecuniary interest? And seeing none. <clears throat> We'll move to the minutes. I'll need a motion that the minutes of the council meeting of January 10th, 2023, and the minutes of the committee of the whole meeting on January 24th, 2023, be adopted as presented. I have a move for that. Derek, second by Lori. Any discussion on the minutes? All in favor? And that's also carried. No petitions. We have two delegations this evening. I'll need a motion that. Jeff Barton um, from Energy and Asset Manager Manager for last uh, to speak about automated speed enforcement. And Kelly Rakowski is also uh, here as a delegate. So uh, I need a motion to receive them as delegates. Council uh, moved by Lori, second by Councilor Wagner. All in favor? And that's carried. We'll call on Jeff now to make his presentation. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Um, Your Worship, Mayors, uh, Mayor Nowak, uh, members of council and staff, thank you for inviting me here to, to speak to you tonight. My name is Jeff Barton. I am a community member here in Wellesley, but more importantly, I'm here today speaking to you on behalf of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, uh, their business services arm, LAS. I'm here to talk about automated speed enforcement, our service um, that provides you with a useful tool that you may be able to administer traffic justice in your community. So, Forgive me as I get into this. Here we go. So for any new faces, I just want to introduce who is LAS. This is the company I work for. They're the business services arm of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. And AMO, we represent the 444 municipal governments in Ontario. So and LAS was created by AMO in 1992, and our sole reason for existing is to develop programs and services for you, our municipalities. We are a not-for-profit, and we're governed by a board of directors that is made up of municipal staff and elected officials. Our mission is to help our municipalities work better. We've all seen the headlines, headlines about speeding and the dangers it poses to members in our community. And most of you already know what automated speed enforcement is, given that you've seen the cameras on your roads in St. Clements and in the town of Wellesley, the village. It's a powerful tool that actually works to reduce speeding and it's been proven. I'll get this right one of these times. 
In Ontario, there are several key pieces of legislation related to ASE. The first one is the Provincial Offenses Act. It uh, relates to any provincial offenses, including traffic violations, bylaw charges, and other provincial charges. The second is the Highway Traffic Act, which authorizes things like licensing the rules of the road and traffic offenses, speeding fines, that kind of thing. And the third one is the Safer School Zones Act, which sets the stage for the use of automated speed enforcement in school zones and community safety zones in Ontario. So those are the only two spots where you can currently use this. Together, these acts enable regulation 39819, which spells out the rules and processes around how to deploy ASE in your community. So on December 1st, 2019, that regulation was put into place by the province, the legal framework to give you the option as a municipality to use camera technology-based enforcement in your communities. The objective of Ontario's framework has always been to ensure municipalities develop responsible, transparent, and effective programs to garner public acceptance of automated speed enforcement technology with the hopes that it will lead to safe roads. Unlike the red light camera regulations, which came out in 1999, this regulation does not prescribe a single service provider. Rather, it opens up many options for municipalities. And here, I'm here today to talk about your options. So shortly after the regulation came out, LAS was asked by our board and several different municipalities to investigate how to build a turnkey program using automated speed enforcement. So over the past couple of years, we've been busy building a program that works across Ontario. It's modeled after Toronto's Joint Processing Center, which you may be familiar with and their partnership with Redflex, but it's geared towards small and medium municipalities. So on the screen now, you can see a snapshot of what our service includes. It's a turnkey service, so you can focus on the other important issues in your communities. There are no upfront costs to join, and we offer the flexibility of short and long-term camera contracts. The goal is not to have to limit the system. This is our ultimate goal, that we don't have to limit the system operating times or the number of fences allowed by a camera. It includes the ticket or violation processing, by provincial offenses officers. And it also includes the collections piece or the, uh, the issuance of the fines. So for the uh, fine administration, we hope to provide, we eventually will provide two options for a municipality to consider. The first is issue the fines through the courts, the traditional way as uh, you're currently, or the region is currently doing it here. The second is the use of administrative penalties as a means of issuing the fines. And I'll talk about APs in a moment. So right now, just to let you know where we're at as LAS, we're working through the stages of developing this program. It's pretty complex, so it's taking a bit of time. We convened a committee to complete an RFP in the spring of 2021. 
And the goal was to determine a service provider to take care of the camera leasing, maintenance, and the back end software. So from that, Conduit was selected as a successful bidder. They have speed enforcement and red light cameras deployed in six Canadian provinces and all across the US. So with Conduit involved, the supply, installation, maintenance, and relocation of the camera is all taken care of by that company. And any repairs or vandalism, that kind of thing is also covered within that leasing agreement. So it truly is a hands-off approach for you. You don't need to worry about your cameras, uh, anything to do with them. You just set it, uh, sign the contract and they take care of the rest. Conduit also has a data management software to perform the back office work for the processing center. So our next, our next step is to get the ticket processing center up and running. We are on the verge. I'm happy to announce we are just weeks away from signing an agreement with the municipality to employ provincial defense officers dedicated to the LAS program to process tickets. That's been a long, long coming uh, piece of the puzzle and we're pretty excited about it. Once those staff are in place, we will we'll undertake a pilot program to make sure all the processes work properly, that it works with the MTO systems, with the courts, that the cameras work proper. And after that, we're going to take in a second municipality uh, to make sure that this processing municipality can actually process their tickets properly as well. So finally, if all goes well, we'll continue the expansion and open the program up to any other interested municipalities later this year. The long-term solution for our processing center, the vision that we see, is a joint municipal services board under the Municipal Act to oversee and direct the ticket processing centers. Creating this will be done in parallel with the pilot study over the summer and into the fall. And if you're wondering what that board is, it's a collective of municipalities with the capacity to process tickets who will hire officers dedicated to our service in Ontario. So initially they'll process on behalf of or they will process on behalf of all participating municipalities, regardless of size or location. And this model will be funded by LAS ourselves so that you don't have any upfront costs. There's no need to pay to join and it will be open to all. Eventually, we hope that this will self-fund through the proceeds from the tickets um, so that it's it's kind of a break even type program. That is our goal. We're not here to make money. We're here to improve the safety in our communities, and that is our sole focus of this program. The benefit of having this kind of model is that once the processing center reaches capacity, we can easily expand it by adding by replicating the model and adding another municipality who has capacity to protest. So it's basically, we are gonna aggregate municipalities who have capacity to process. And as we grow, as more and more municipalities join, we'll add more and more processing centers. So I mentioned earlier, I just cannot get this tonight. <laughs> I mentioned earlier about administrative penalties. So right now, I believe your cameras, if I understand correctly, they're handled by the region and uh, the township does not receive any funds from those fines. 
The entire amount is received by the region and all offenses go through the region's court system. With administrative penalties, this is a different option for municipalities to consider. It was allowed or, or brought in, into effect in July 2022. It allows for an alternate way of collecting fines. It really it gives control to municipalities who may not be in charge of their own court system or who rely on others to collect fines on their behalf. And basically what it means, if you have an administrative penalty system, that the revenues that you collect will go directly to the participating municipality. So for instance, if Wellesley decided we want to do an administrative penalty system, you would collect the fines yourself from your own cameras. They wouldn't go through, for instance, the region. So it is our goal to have this available through LAS at a later date. We will be working with staff at our processing centers to make sure we have the correct hearing and screening officers so that we can deliver this service as an option for municipalities. All right, so you have cameras already, so some of this may be review, but we are telling any interested municipalities who would like to uh, explore our program, here's what you can do. So as a decision maker, you already have ideas where speed is in your, in your communities. This is an award thing. This isn't a political platform. This has nothing to do with being reelected. It's all about safety, especially in this township. So traffic data is your friend. We're encouraging any interested municipalities to use their data to determine the best location for a camera. You need to be able to justify your decisions and this data will prove invaluable for doing that. If you, if you don't have the data, then our contract with Conduit, they do have the ability to uh, do traffic studies and, and help you to decide where to best deploy your cameras. As I mentioned, right now you can only place them in community or school zones. So it is going to be up to you to make sure that any areas you want to enforce are designated in that way. If it is on a regional road, I believe that is the region's uh, jurisdiction to designate. If it is on a, a local road that is not regional, then that would fall under your jurisdiction and you would have to make sure that your community safety zone is designated. So this may require you to pass bylaws and enact these zones and it could take a couple months. So if you are considering that, that's something you may want to put on your agenda for the next coming months so that you're ready when cameras are ready. Um, finally, Oh, not finally, I got one more page after this. AMO and LAS continue to advocate on behalf of this sector to allow this technology in other zones like construction zones or non-designated zones, other roads, because we know that speeding is not just in a school zone. It's not just an issue in a safety zone. To make appropriate decisions, though, the MTO needs supporting data. So that's, again, the data from these ASE deployments and traffic studies is going to be important uh, to that decision-making process. The other thing you may want to consider, and I know you've already, the region has already deployed, but as a township to show leadership and transparency, you may want to think about how you can educate your residents. 
Launching an education campaign will help with public acceptance and shows great leadership and accountability. Finally, LAS is developing an interest form so I can reach out to staff or they're welcome to reach out to me uh, in the coming days. If you're interested, I can send you that form. And I'd ask that you watch for more announcements in the coming days and weeks as we continue to roll out this program. So that's all I have for today. I'll open it up for you, Mayor Nowak, for questions. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, questions for Jeff. I think it's a, an exciting uh, opportunity. Um, we discussed it a bit at the region today. I'll just let council see what what they have to ask and present. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, just a question, Jeff, on your cameras. So when they get installed, what's the typical length of installation? Or is there a contract? Like, are they up for a year, five years? What's, what's the payoff time for you guys, I guess? So I don't think there's really a payoff time. Um, but through our program, there are several options um we have when we convened our committee we had a gentleman from a very small municipality who said i only need them for the summer because that's when we have all the um all the uh vacationers come through and they speed like crazy in the winter we're a sleepy hollow so we've set up terms uh camera terms with conduit of six months, a year, two years, and we're working on a four-year uh, camera deployment. So short-term to long-term. Typically, what we would say is if you're not, if you're not uh, going to leave the camera, if you choose to have one camera and rotate it around, we would suggest you leave it in place for at least a month in one location. Um, the service does have a relocation option that we can relocate it on a monthly basis. Any more than that, it gets really confusing because there is requirements for 90 day signage and it, it just, it gets really confusing to, to track. When have you put out the signs? Are you allowed to put up a camera now? That kind of thing. <clears throat> There's one other question then too. Our, our current cameras, you said it through the region. Um, I don't necessarily know exactly how those work. Do you know, are we in a contract? This, this might be a staff question. Are we in a contract on those cameras or how does how does that work? We're not in a contract, I don't believe. We don't, uh, we've given them permission or do we even give them permission? No, we work with the region to different locations and things like that, but we have nothing to do with the actual program. It's all in the region. All in the region. So. And uh, so we talked about that at council today. There is you know, part of the budget process. They're looking at expanding that, uh, buying more cameras in and, and uh, um, you know, expanding the, the number of sites uh, where they, they want them to plug. So they're, they're doing a, um, a study right now to determine which ones are going to be most effective. Um, you know, I think it's interesting, you know, it's not meant to be a cash grab. As a matter of fact, I think the success of these will um, be proven by lower revenues. That's that's our goal. Yeah. And hopefully over time you see you see the revenues drop off because your speeds are going down. The community safety zone uh, is one area that uh, the region hadn't allowed or hadn't uh, had a uh, a bylaw that would allow them on community safety zones, I don't believe. Um, they've, we've asked them today to expand that, their program to include uh, community safety zones. So they are going to be looking at that as another option to place them. We had them out to, and just for information, uh, we had them out to uh, look at Linwood situation. Um, and there's an example where a community safety zone uh, is important because when you put it, when you put them on a school zone, the school has to be fronting on regional property. That's the criteria for the region. For the yeah, region, nice. that's in their bylaw. I understand the school in Linwood doesn't front the property. It's there's Jane. It's, uh, is it Jane Street that goes back to the school? Pine, 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 Pine Street. Pine Street. Yeah. 
chains in here. Mm -hmm. um, so it wouldn't qualify as a school zone, but if they change it and have it designated as a community safety zone, then they could put one. They could put one there. Um, the biggest issue that we have, I think, all council will agree, is and all rural areas, um, uh, traffic coming in and out of, of, of the community, and that's usually on regional roads. So I know that the region is going to be coming up with some sort of a plan. Um, to address those issues. I think uh, there's going to be meetings held in March and April with CAOs, and hopefully we, we've passed a motion today that some action has to start taking place as early as this summer. So whether that includes more uh, more of this type of uh, arrangement, these do work. There's no question that it works. So I think, it's, uh, I think it's great to hear that this is a possibility, and uh, we certainly want to be kept up to date on on anything that uh, any information that you may want to share with us, I'm not sure how it would work at this moment, a municipality of our size, whether we could do it on our own, and whether we would have enough township roads where we would want to consider it. But uh, I mean, those are questions that we can uh, we can have a look at when the time comes. Yeah, I was if if I may, I was going to suggest the region they can put them on the regional roads and and. Um, in in the town in the village of Wellesley in in St. Clements, those schools are on the regional road. Yeah, I'm not sure how the region would um, operate them on the township road. How that agreement will look. So that would be up to you to talk to the region about if you wanted them on your local township on your local township on roads. That would be up to you to negotiate with them or to explore a different option outside of the region. So, so I understand that we would have to we would have to develop our own bylaw that would right on how to designate uh, community safety zone. I think one to mention. I just want to clarify that the school in Wellesley is on the township road. Oh it is the program does work in that regard, uh, only in the school zone though. Yeah. Not in the community safety zone currently. My apologies. I thought Queen's Bush was a regional oh, Okay, <laughs> to the intersection. Okay. Okay, any other questions? <clears throat> Thank you so much for taking the time to come. Uh, I don't Thank know how far you had to drive, but uh, not too far. Not too far, so it's not so bad. Are you welcome to stay? I uh, I may, I may not. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll hear from other recovery. No, I'm sorry. We have another delegation coming up right now. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Kelly Burkowski, and tonight I am here for two reasons. Firstly, to express what our residents know, that the new facility portion of our tax increase is grossly unacceptable. As moderator of the Facebook group St. Clements Organized, I have read through every comment up until tonight's meeting. Some of what I'm going to say here are the words of these members. In 2014, Council paid Monteith and Brown $22,600 for a strategic master plan on community parks, recreation, and culture. Page 40 of this document, which I have included in the second part, states that the possibility of a twin pad arena has been discussed for several years in the township as a way to mitigate the rising capital and operating costs of maintaining the two aging single pad arenas. Based on input received, and our experience as both recreation and urban planners, the many community benefits of maintaining single pad arenas within both St. Clements and the village of Wellesley outweigh the financial benefits of replacing them with a centrally located multi pad facility. Page 70, they state it bears noting that the recommendations are based on what is needed 
and not necessarily what is financially achievable by the township. Page 71, the planners clearly remark that council must seek fundraising, partnership, and sponsorship opportunities to reduce reliance on tax dollars in providing quality parks, recreation, and cultural opportunities in the township. Master planners who were very aware of the needs of our community clearly warned that the township's small and dispersed population base would make it difficult to financially support a large multi-use facility, which are found in large cities. So what happened? Council ignored Monteith and Brown's advice and findings. Council proceeded in making this decision with no idea what the debt and the operating costs for the facility were going to be. This decision alone proves a lack of good financial governance. Even though council consulted with various community groups, a project of this financial magnitude should have been put to a referendum, but it was not. The only say some of the community had was on the amenities. Why I say some of the community is because not every resident was aware of the build. Not every resident is involved in social media. Nor does every resident check the township's website on a regular basis, nor subscribe to the paper. When council was debating on a project of this scale, it is not our responsibility to be aware of what council is planning. When a decision is this fast, it is council's duty to ensure the entire community is aware. Before the desired amenities were discussed in meetings with the community groups, such as hockey, soccer, and doctor's office, a vote should have occurred to see if taxpayers wanted to foot the bill. A vote should have been sent to each tax paying household within all of Wellesley Township with a clear, concise breakdown of the realistic build cost and the full financial implications presented as the very first step. Council is being held to account for the lie, which you stated in regards to tax implications on every household that you represent. Many of our expenses for building of the complex have changed with no public consultation nor review. It appears that once council greenlit the construction, you are continuing to agree to increase in costs without review or consultation within the community. To date, the build cost has grown from 22 million to 27.2 million, which at this point in construction is an increase of 25%. In June of 2021, our mayor announced that through both grants and fundraising, the average tax bill would increase by approximately $47. As commented on Facebook, and I quote, are we supposed to just assume the original announcement that identifies our cost of $47 was a mistake, that the residents of Wellesley Township would just accept such a flagrant disregard for transparency? With 3,335 tax paying households, a bill of 27.2 million minus provincial grant of just over 16 million puts an additional financial burden at this point of $3,319 on each household. This debt each household is incurring is before errors in either the design and or the build is discovered. Errors which have already occurred, such as the foundational footings, being incorrect are dollars that each household has to endure. When increases in the pricing materials and key lending rates are factored in, this burden on each of these 3,300 households are far from the original quoted $47. Our community is outraged. <clears throat> I cannot state this any more clearly. One comment which was made on Facebook was, I propose that we pay the $47 that was clearly communicated to all of us and allow those who sit on council, those who approved the increase, to carry the rest. I'm sorry, we're going to have to be careful with this. This is We want to have a respectful discussion here. But we're not going to allow for outbursts. Okay. I would rather uh, might as well go home then if we can. They would like us to go home. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Go on through it. As you were aware, current property taxes were based off of the 2016 MPAC assessments, with the increases which are due to not only the recreational complex, but the new MPAC assessments, our taxes are going to surge. 
The complex is responsible for 7.7% of the 13.89% increase. This is leading to comments such as, we are settled with debt, a debt that I for one did not ask for, a debt that was never appropriately communicated, and a debt I do not want to pay for. Those who have now burdened a large population of this township with an egregious tax burden must be held to account. Six to eight percent is a reasonable rate of tax increase in this economy. This rate should be inclusive of both the rec center, which is a want, and the township's actual needs such as roads and maintenance. Council, you have made the drastically wrong decision by taking what was identified in 2014 by Monteith and Brown as what is needed, and ultimately, after consultations with some community groups, you blatantly ignored the strong advice that these decisions are not financially achievable by the township residents. Council, the taxes which you have burdened every single household is grossly unacceptable. This cannot be stated any more clearly. You must reduce this rate. You work for us. You were elected to represent all residents, and this you must. The second reason I came is to remind you of your fiduciary duty, which is a critical aspect of your role on the council. You must prioritize the best interests of the electorate and act in good faith with honesty, transparency, and fairness in all of your decisions and actions. This duty helps to ensure accountability and builds trust between the elected officials and the community that they serve. If a councilor disregards their fiduciary duty, you are facing serious consequences, including damage to your reputation, legal action, and removal from office. Additionally, the community's trust in your governance may be eroded, and important decisions which impact the well being of all the community may be negatively affected. With no record of a 7.7% increase being discussed by council, being found in any recordings, agendas, nor, min nor minutes, may this lack of discussion serve as public record that this is a blatant lack of transparency and governance on council part. To close, a quote by Aristotle in his works titled Politics. The truth is that men's ambition and their desire to make money are among the most frequent causes of deliberate acts of injustice. Wellesley cannot afford the Wellesley Township Recreation Center to be your legacy. Thank you. Well, very well said. Very well said. Thank you. Very Council has any questions? Oh, I'm just wondering if anybody had any questions oh. from Council. So Council would have an opportunity. We wouldn't accept questions from the audience at this point, but some of the Council if they have any questions. Uh, there may not be a head. Council would like to. Oh, so I'll ask a question, Mayor. Um, thank you, Kelly, for your presentation you. and providing this. It's good to work through. Um, there's just a, a couple of things. The one I'll ask Rick to just clarify. Um, your one line here about the impact assessments and the increases that are due with the new impact assessments down the road, our taxes are going to surge. And that's Rick to clarify how that works in our taxes. Sure. Thanks, Councillor Rick. Um, the reassessment by impact does not mean a tax increase for homeowners. Um, in the end, the township has to run a balanced budget. So we set the dollars that we need, and that is divided over all of the taxpayers. And it's a proportionate amount of your assessment compared to the overall assessment of the township. Mm -hmm. So because they'll reassess every property, the overall assessment goes down, or sorry, goes up, which means your tax rate goes down. So we still collect the same number of dollars in the end. The township doesn't collect the additional monies because your assessment goes up. Well, from what I understand right now in St. Clements, the, in 2016, the average house price was, I believe, about 300 and mm. 389, 389,000. Now it's at 800 and about 850. Yes, but we're so, talking the difference between assessed value and real estate value. There's no correlation between the two. So when it's reassessed, they will go on 
sales in the last, I believe it's five years. I'm not quite sure what they're going to do now yeah. because of the 2020 debt, the right. missing 2020. But what MPAC does is when they reassess, it will bring those values up more in line with, with what current real estate values are. But again, your house will be proportionate to your neighbor's house, to your neighbor's house, to your neighbor's house. So everybody still has the same percentage, basically, of the overall assessment, uh -huh. which then means your percentage of the overall assessment doesn't change, so your taxes don't go up. Right, but if my entire street we bought for, say, 450, yeah. and now my entire street is valued at, say, 1.3, yeah. my taxes are gonna go up. No. <laughs> because it's still proportionate. Every house in the township may go up. Our taxes are not going down. So it's still proportionate. Not because of the assessments. So that's how reassessment works. So what it doesn't you're saying, allow the township to collect okay. more dollars. So what you're guaranteeing us is that our taxes are not going up by more than $47? I am not guaranteeing that. <laughs> If you don't mind, I'll answer. What I'm explaining is what reassessment does to tax rates. It does not increase your tax rate on your house. Okay. It will actually reduce your tax rate, but it will keep the tax dollars roughly the same. That's how the system works. Eric, so one more question, just uh, for clarification, I mean, from Rick. Um, as we we collect taxes on behalf of other people, can you explain the breakdown of that just for everyone? So yes, I can. One second, I'm just going to pull up the press release that we put out. The township's portion of your overall tax bill is approximately 31 percent of that bill. The region is approximately 53 percent, and school boards is approximately 16 percent. So any increase that the township um, passes in their budget is only applied to the 31% of the tax bill. So it's only on the township levy. It's not on the regional levy or on the school board levy. The regional levy, same way, only goes on the regional levy, not on the township levy or on the school board levy. And the school boards have indicated a zero increase for this year. I, I think, if I may, what everyone in the room I'm pretty sure would agree with me by saying is that 14% is unacceptable. 14% is a burden for some families who are making $90,000, $100,000 or more, not so much. Seniors that are on a fixed income, it's going to be huge. When you go to the grocery store and your groceries are huge and you have children to feed, this is something that, yes, we are not saying that we did not want a facility. What we are saying is that there's no transparency on the cost. And there's no transparency on other factors that have happened. Do you want to respond to that? Or? Yeah, I, I would actually make a comment on the transparency piece. So on March. March 15, 2022, a report was taken to council. And this was for the final debenture issuance of $8 million. And that is what's been borrowed by the township for the rec complex is $8 million out of the $27.2 million. And the financial implication of that would be approximately $112.80 per household per year. That's again on the average. Assessed value. And of what is the average assessed value that you were using, if I may ask? So it's the 389000 which again, that is the average. The way we get that average is take the overall assessment of all houses in the township divided by the number of houses in the township. So that is the true average assessed value of a house in the township. It is not what your house is worth today, it is what MPAC has as the average assessment in the township. The big difference between those two. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions for me? Okay. Did you have anything else? Okay. Well, thank you so much for, for yeah. coming. Thank you. Okay.
Question. We're now, I'm sorry, we're not taking questions from the name. Tell you what, if 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 you want to get would you let me talk, sir? If you'd like to get more information on specific um questions that you may have, why don't you arrange for a group of we have a, a boardroom with seats for 12 people in that boardroom? We will set oh, up a, would you let me talk, sir? <laughs> I have to maintain some decor in here. Get a group together, come in, we'll make arrangements, whether it's if it's better in the evening, we'll sit down with your group. If you want to get several groups over a period of time, we'll do that. We'll have staff there to answer these questions. And we're more than happy to do that. Just to clarify, there's a lot of misinformation. I talked with a gentleman tonight when we were standing outside. That thought that the 15% or the 14% was for his entire tax bill, which isn't true. We know that there was other misinformation on, on Facebook that was put up there that wasn't taken down once the person knew that it wasn't right. So please, you're welcome to come into the office, have a chat with us, set up a meeting, and we'll answer all your questions. Who can I set up a meeting with? You can talk with you, you can me. talk. Uh, with our clerk or our deputy clerk, she'll help arrange that meeting. I will have to do maybe more than one. What's wrong with right now? Mayor, give me a call and we'll. I'm wrong. Okay. That's why we come over here. Yeah, we're all here now. This is a council meeting we have an agenda. We're sticking with our agenda. Oh, today. Yeah, it's man, it's funny that the other post on the point. Are you going to have anything that I could ask about the uh, town safety zones where you can constitute as a safety zone on the road? So, sorry, folks, but council meeting like this is not open forum for questions. Uh, this is a meeting that's open to the public. Oh. It's not a public meeting. There's a big difference, and we have to stick to the agenda, and that's in the procedural bylaw and this black. So you can come as a delegation at a, at a different meeting, or you can bring your questions to staff as well. Thank what you. else is still on the agenda? <laughs> we have three reports. Uh, I believe it's three reports that we'll be dealing with um, shortly. Uh, yes. uh, are you welcome to stay in this report? Okay. I need a motion now that the committee of the whole rise go to the committee. Council rise and go into the committee of the whole to receive reports and recommendation moved by Council Wagner, second by Council Seven. All in favor? That's carried. We'll move right to Rosie Ridge. Uh, Sorry. We can we can
I need a motion by Alton Bridge 3723 tandem truck contract number 2023 uh, 01 revised. Yeah. I need, uh, sorry, a mover. Councillor Herget. Seconder. Councillor Wagner. Uh, before we do discussion, Chris would like to make a clarification. Yes, thank you, Councillor Seven. Sorry, one quick uh, point of clarification down on the financial implications at the bottom. I referenced a number of three seventy seven, three hundred and seventy seven thousand two hundred eighty four dollars thirty six cents that was approved on January tenth. That number was a previous quote. That wasn't the number that you actually approved on January tenth. It was actually three hundred sixty seven thousand two hundred sixty eight dollars and twelve cents. That's the only clarification you have to make. Thank you, Councilor Seven. Any other discussion? Councilor Herbert? So, you were going to get international chassis. Now, uh, that's changed. That's correct. Yes, we originally we had priced out a uh, international cabin chassis, and that um, it was a very frustrating process. And I actually talked to Jeff Barton here from LAS about it. So, LAS is going to be looking into the um, supplier and as to why this happened because we had a contract in place. The uh, council voted on the amount. We asked the order to go through. A while later, uh, the supplier came back and said they weren't able to supply the truck at the price that they originally quoted. Um, so it was obviously extremely frustrating. And then through some back and forth, we decided to go with an ultimate supplier, the same truck manufacturer that we were going with with the initial uh, contract. We're still awarding the contract to. That was completely separate from the cabin chassis supplier. Um, but yes, now we've switched to a freight liner supplier. So, yes. Just a, a question, Chris. So, the, the contract still remains with Viking. Is that how that works? It's just their price increase. Was the price increase from Viking that they pass on from the, the truck supplier? Is that how that works? Or how? That's correct. So, we have uh, one single. Uh, contract will be with Viking for the supply and delivery of the truck as a whole. Um, they get the truck through their the Freightliner or International Cabin Chassis supplier. Um, so, and it's all part of one contract for Mustang. And they, Viking was extremely frustrated with this uh, as well. So they were they were happy with it. Is this something that they've seen with other, I mean, like obviously they don't just build one truck for Wobbly Township. Have they seen that for other townships or? There are, that's a great question. There, I was talking to another municipality as well that was uh, quoted word for word what I told, uh, what I was told from uh, the supplier, they were told word for word as well. Um, so in talking with that other municipality, they decided to do the exact same thing that we have um, and um, switch over to a Freightliner cabin chassis as well, and Viking will, they have the contract with Viking and they're going to build the truck for them as well. Sorry, just one more question. The, the supply of this truck, we're still looking at 18 to 24 months? That's correct, yeah. In switching to um, Freightliner cabin chassis, the timeline still may, um, is maintained. So we have a build slot with uh, Freightliner. The cabin chassis should be supplied later this year, and then Viking will build the box and the uh, plow and wing and all those kinds of things uh, and supply to us they're aiming for about October 2024. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? All in favor? Very unanimously. I need another motion. Roten Bridge 4 slash 2023, damage to mailboxes by snow plows, um, policy update. Recommendation that the Council of the Township of Wellesley approve roads policy number 31 regarding damage to rural residential mailboxes on township owned roadways as a result of contact by township owned and operated snow plow during regular winter operations. And further, the roads policy number 31 supersede any previous policies relating to damage of mailboxes due to winter plowing operations. May I have a mover? Councillor Wagner? Seconder? Councillor Brick? Discussion? Councillor Brick? 
a bit of a, a question, I guess, for you, Chris. The so we're saying that any damage due to contact with the plow. That's correct. What 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 resources does it take to to argue that with the resident versus like contact versus the plow versus contact versus snow? So do you, there, see, do you foresee an issue there? I guess is my question. It is left up to a little bit of interpretation. There are some telltale signs. If there's paint, for example, paint marking that kind of thing on the mailbox, that's a pretty uh, good indicator that it was struck by the plow. Depending on the type of uh, damage, where the um, break actually occurred, uh, things like that. So we would investigate each of these. And if we're uncertain, if we're not talking about a lot of money per per mailbox, if we're uncertain. We're probably going to lean on the side of we'll just reimburse or, or replace them with that mailbox. Um, but we just don't want to, we had to put some limit on it because there are um, old cedar posts, for example, four inch round cedar posts that people use for mailboxes that deteriorate over time and a little stiff breeze could blow some of those over. So we had to put some limitation. Do you expect uh, we've got in here that we have uh, six claims annually currently? Do you expect that to increase? No, this, no, I wouldn't this. expect it to increase. I know there are some residents that have had their mailboxes broken off in the past um, that know the policy and they, some of them don't even call in, they just replace them themselves. Generally, our staff, if they hit it with the plow, they know that they hit it and they generally would uh, report that to us. Uh, we received one last week or um, an operator reported it to me and the phone rang about 10 minutes later. So um, our staff are pretty diligent with reporting it to me when that happens. Um, and if they're not, we again we love to investigate and we'll reimburse a few That was my last question. Do we reach out proactively to residents if we <laughs> if we if do the, the damage? Usually they're pretty quick to, to pick up the phone. Um, if there's um, damage then that they're not used to. Um, but we don't necessarily go out and proactively reach out to the residents. What we will do is take uh, we have several mailboxes on P stands, we call them. We put a sandbag on them and we put a temporary one up at the end of the laneway just so that they can still receive their mail. Um, and that's a good indicator for them that we know we've hit it and we will potentially replace it. So the old policy said that we didn't replace it at all. And this is I'm proposing that we do replace it with a minimal. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All in favor? Carried unanimously. Okay, thank you, Lori. We'll go to uh, jump to admin and finance and personnel report. There's one uh, report there. It's a recommendation and uh, motion, or the recommendation is, is that the Council of the Township of Wellesley receive this report from information moved by Council Wagner, second by Council Seven. Any discussion on this? This is, I think, uh, an important uh, process uh, that we're going to be going through sort of sets up our direction for the next four years. We've had a great one. I think the one that we've had has is, is worked very well for us. Be some tweaks maybe when we're looking forward to that. Yeah. But uh, other than that. Okay. All in favor then? And that's carried as well. Get back to the top. Information items. Are there any information items that council would like to be have brought forward? Seeing none, made a motion that the information items be um, received as uh, reported. Moved by Councillor Brick, seconded by Councillor Seven. All in favor? And that's carried. Motion now that maybe the whole rise and council resume and report. Moved by Councillor Seven, Councillor Second by Councillor Wagner. All in favor? Motion of the report of the committee that will be adopted to set forth in the motions and actions detailed above. Moved by Councilor Wagner, seconded by Councilor Brick. All in favor? And that's carried. Now it's unfinished business. Other part, other uh, notice motion, new business. Coming forward. Okay. I'm sorry, I missed that. Which one? I just want to, I went through them fairly quickly there. Wasn't anticipating. You good? 
So we'll move to bylaws. Uh, one bylaw. I need a motion to bylaw number 62023 be read the first and second time. It's confirming Councillor Wagner, second by Councillor Seven. All in favor? Carry the same bylaw, pass first and second reading. Moved by Councillor Brick, second by Councillor Wagner. All in favor? Carried. Same bylaw, be read a third time, passed in the mayor and clerk. Be authorized to sign and seal the bylaw. The seal moved by. Councillor Briggs, second by Councillor Herbert. All in favor? And that's carried. Councillor Wagner, would you like to adjourn? All in favor? Aye. 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 A